Good afternoon and thank you very much, Nikki. So when you invited me to talk about the future of education at the Singularity University Summit, my first thought was, what does education have to do with this event? If anything, education is one of the few industries that have failed to realize significant efficiency improvements because of technology. We still teach pretty much the same way we did for centuries. And education remains a highly labor-intensive and increasingly expensive process that is changing much slower than our times demand. The result? Well, the cost of education is the fastest rising among all products and services. This graph plots the changes in, of the cost of various products and services relative to inflation between 2005 and 2014. We can immediately spot the divide between exponential technologies like computers, televisions, cell phone service, whose costs are plummeting, from services that have stubbornly resisted technological change, car mechanics, childcare, and the king of them all, education. And despite the rising costs, education is not doing a great job preparing people for today's labor market. More and more employers around the world report that they cannot find people who possess the right skills. In summary, education is as far from being an exponential technology as one can get. Nevertheless, unless education can help people function effectively in a world that is increasingly dominated by exponential technologies, we are in trouble. And this is why this topic is just as important to talk about as the technologies themselves. So I have been working on redefining education at Boston University for the last seven years. In this presentation, I would like to share with you some of my predictions of how education needs and will change to accommodate the needs of an exponential world. So my first prediction is that education will become a lifelong service. The role of education has traditionally been viewed as preparing a person for success in the world. However, in a world that is constantly changing, most skills and competencies become obsolete within a few years. We therefore need to reframe education's mission as helping a person stay fit for success in an ever-changing world. This makes education a continuous activity, like going to the gym or having our periodic medical checkup. In the same way that we visit our doctor every six months to assess our medical fitness and we receive remedial treatment if necessary, people will increasingly need to be monitoring their education fitness, the extent to which their skills and competencies are up to the circumstances of our changing world, and then engage in periodic and continuous educational treatment that keeps them fit to continue pursuing their goals in life. This reframing of education as a lifelong service will have fundamental consequences for the entire structure of the education industry, some of which I will discuss in later in my presentation. Does this all mean that there will be no need for universities? No people will still need some form of intensive preparatory higher education stage. But the emphasis of this stage will shift from teaching technical skills, skills that change and have to be replaced every four, five, six years, to developing the fundamental competencies such as thinking creatively, communicating effectively, coping with change, working well with others, and of course, learning how to learn. Research shows that whether one becomes an engineer, a lawyer, or a teacher, it is such skills and not technical competencies that correlate most strongly with long-term success. The American educational model is currently ahead of the European one in that dimension. American education is based on the liberal arts tradition and places emphasis on general education before focusing on a student's major field of study. Some American universities are redefining liberal arts for the 21st century by explicitly focusing on and measuring the development of transferable skills such as empathy, humility, comfort with ambiguity into their curriculum. For example, Northeastern University in Boston explicitly includes such skills in its undergraduate curriculum and even gives its students an app through which they can track their progress 
not only on cognitive skills, but also on all these all important so-called soft skills. Prediction number two, the value of education will increasingly come from relationships, not content. One thing that COVID has exposed is that education is a rich bundle of services of which the transmission of knowledge via courses is just one. Students who were abruptly forced to remote course delivery found that they missed all the other pieces of the bundle, the mentoring, the community, the experientials, collectively referred to here in America as the campus experience. In the USA, some students have sued their universities to get their money back because they didn't feel that courses alone justified the tuition cost. So in a world where education is moving to digital delivery, the educational content will be the first component of the bundle to become a commodity. 95% of the content we teach is identical to that of the next institution down the road. In the near future, consolidation of educational content will be inevitable. A relatively small number of sources will provide the content for the world in a similar way that a small number of textbooks are used by most universities in a given field. Differentiation and competition among uh, different educational institutions will increasingly rest on the mentoring, the community, and the experiential components of the service offering. That is on the relationship part of the education, education equation. These are the areas where institutions should be paying increasing attention in years to come. So I foresee that, let's say, in 10 years, the value proposition of Boston University is not going to be come here because you will get the best lectures from the best professors. Everyone will have access to those lectures. Instead, it will be by coming here, you will be joining a vibrant community of professors, students and alumni that will advise you and support your life goals for the rest of your life. Prediction number three, algorithms and communities will reduce the cost of education. As I mentioned before, cost is one of the major pain points of education today. The current process that relies on teams of faculty and teaching assistants is way too expensive and does not scale. Education is perhaps the only major industry sector that has not realized massive economies of scale because of technology. Now, Economies of scale in the digital economy generally come from two sources, algorithms and communities. Algorithms, such as personalized machine learning and AI, hold substantial promise in helping personalize and automate aspects of the educational process. For example, Georgia Tech has been experimenting with using a chatbot teaching assistant powered by IBM's Watson AI technology in one of its massive open online courses with good results. Other ideas are emerging. For example, instead of grading hundreds of student papers and exams, in the near future, we can envision assessing students automatically by observing their performance in complex simulation exercises. However, the area that I believe holds equal promise and has not been given its due attention is leveraging communities. Communities have worked tremendously well on the internet. Witness the success of large-scale knowledge exchange sites like Quora and Stack Overflow. Witness how corporations like SAP and Microsoft has, have been able to save billions of dollars annually by creating user communities of practice where users help other users solve problems and learn how to better use their software. Humans learn from each other as much as we learn from books and teachers. Boston University has launched a disruptively priced online MBA that costs 20,000 euros and aspires to attract thousands of students from all over the world. We are experimenting with leveraging peer-to-peer -peer interaction to enable student engagement at scale without having to scale the need for professors and teaching assistants. For example, one of the cornerstones of business education is the case discussion. It is very difficult to have a case discussion in a class of more than 50 students. So when we have 500 students, does this mean that we hire 10 professors? No. What we do is that we divide our 500 students in 10 pods of 50 and each pod in 10 teams of five. 
Each team of five discusses the case in a private live Zoom session and writes a report that is then sent to another team for feedback. In addition, teams of the same pod have access to a chat group where they can share and elaborate their ideas. Then there are two live case discussions with a professor, each with five pods in which the 50 team leaders speak out on behalf of their teams. Team leaders rotate from one week to another, and then in this way, a single professor can manage a highly engaged, very interactive class of 500 students. In the next few years, we will figure out ways to leverage peer-to-peer -peer learning even more and integrate it at the heart of scalable, effective educational processes that will be both more personal, but also more social. Prediction number four, faculty will become just one role of a larger team. After living in the United States for more than 30 years, I recently learned a new word, the cowboy doctor. These are the self-taught doctors that were roaming the Wild West in the 19th century, attempting to cure everything from the common call to major surgery, often improvising on situations that they had no expertise on. Now, those of us who grew up in Greece or elsewhere reading the French comic, Looky Look, we have encountered such characters depicted in a less than flattering fashion in the humorous cowboy's adventures. Well, the faculty teach today, the way faculty teach today, sometimes reminds me of cowboy doctors. We operate as sole artisans, responsible for the entire process of designing and delivering courses, often with little formal training in the science of teaching and learning. Now, healthcare, talking about doctors, has come a long way since the time of cowboy doctors and has evolved in a highly specialized collaborative team process. When we visit a hospital today, we typically interact with a variety of specialized technicians, nurses, and the doctor is only one of the many people we meet. In the very near future, faculty will similarly become just one member of a multi-role team. Faculty bring domain knowledge. However, effective education increasingly relies not on the knowledge, but which is in today's world has become a commodity, but in the process and experience design. To produce our online MBA at BU, we of course employ faculty as content experts. However, in addition to faculty, our team includes professional learning designers who take the faculty's knowledge and repackage it in the way that works best in the online medium, educational technologists who build the digital assets of the course in the various platforms we use, social designers who design and support the student experience, and project managers who keep everything running smoothly. Just like in healthcare, the importance and status in, of such roles is going to increase in the future. Teaching and learning will increasingly become a team process where trained professionals will apply the findings of the science of learning to improve the experience of students. And a conjecture, a hypothesis. For innovation to take off, better ways to assess and measure educational outcomes must emerge. Okay, so I gave you a number of predictions. How quickly will all these marvelous changes happen? And will they happen at all? Over my career, I have witnessed many pundits predict radical change in education. Only this change never seems to happen as quickly or as radically than they, that they predict. Like for example, I mean, toy, the way that Nikki and I met was in 2013, I gave a talk here in Athens at TEDx, where I talked about MOOCs. At that time, MOOCs were predicted to fundamentally disrupt education and leave only 50 universities standing. Seven years later, none of this has happened and MOOCs are barely, barely exist. So why is education so resilient to change, even though change, it desperately must? I have been asking myself this question a lot, and I think I have come up with an answer. Change in education will remain slow unless we overcome one fundamental hurdle that has prevented large-scale transformation, the ability to reliably measure and assess the outcome of an educational experience in improving a person's abilities. 
It is difficult to change anything unless you can measure it. Education is one of the very few industries where systematic measurement does not exist, does not take place. Colleges and universities give grades and grant degrees, but as we all know very well, this provides a very fuzzy and unreliable measure of what a person is truly capable of. Most of us do not fully realize the true quality of our own education until much later in our lives. When we choose our children's school, we do it largely on faith. The inability to measure a person's competencies in a meaningful way has led to an industry that is heavily brand-dominated, hierarchical, and resistant to change. Let us pause and think why most of us, especially here in Greece, are obsessed with degrees from big-name universities. Most jobs require degrees because they have no good ways to reliably assess a person's abilities otherwise. So the degree becomes a shorthand for those abilities, and the quality of a person is inferred by the quality of the university. And this is why we all proudly list our degrees in our bios and often in our business cards. The quality of the university, in turn, is largely based on tradition and rankings. The highest ranked universities are the oldest universities, and everyone else wants to look like them. This system is excellent for preserving traditions, but very bad for encouraging innovation. Now, imagine a world where there was a practical way for every person to communicate their true abilities at any given point of time, irrespective of how these abilities have been acquired. In the same way that a health record and a blood test can communicate our cholesterol levels and our iron levels, irrespective of whether we have attained them through diet, through exercise, or through supplements. In such a world, we would no, no, no longer be so obsessed with degrees. And then, by measuring a person's competencies before and after, we would be able to assess the true value of a wide variety of educational experiences, from courses to boot camps to internships, simulation training, communities of practice, etc. Innovation in education will explode once we develop reliable data-driven methods that can assess the value of a given educational innovation in improving a person's ability to be successful in the world. This, of course, is easier said than done. It needs both technical advances and undoing centuries of culture. In some areas, standardized testing of competencies by professional associations may provide part of the answer. But not all competencies can be reliably inferred by testing, and practically every form of testing is subject to multiple biases. Big data can be very promising. In today's world, we all leave an increasingly detailed digital footprint in our LinkedIn profile, our Twitter feed, and everything else that is posted about us. This can be analyzed by machines to discover correlations between a person's life experiences and their abilities. If lots and lots of information about people's training experiences and employment and social performance could be shared in a huge repository, machine learning could be employed to discover patterns that could help us understand how various experiences connect to building competencies and skills. Some employers, like Ernst & Young, are beginning to perform something along those lines at a smaller scale internally by not looking at degrees and using internal models of success to assess applicants with potentially non-standard backgrounds. Don't get me wrong, this is a difficult problem. But if I was a government wanting to see long-term improvements in education, this is the first area I would make investments in. Making advances here, transforming education from a good will largely take on faith to a measurable service is the key that will unlock everything else. To conclude, and with the danger of being just another pundit whose predictions will never become a reality, education is a sector where radical change is long overdue. In my opinion, the most important change that the exponential technologies will force on education is the transition from a preparatory service to a continuous activity that will last throughout a person's life. The fact that information is everywhere will also shift the value of education from the transference of knowledge to the mentoring, advice, and network, 
networking pieces. So education will increasingly be about relationships, not content. The cost of education must be addressed. Education is one of the very few industry sectors that have not achieved economies of scale due to technology. This is socially unsustainable. As with many other knowledge intensive sectors, leveraging communities and algorithms can achieve important breakthroughs. Education will increasingly be designed and delivered by multi-role teams where traditional teachers will be just one member and not necessarily the leader. In a world where knowledge is ubiquitous, content expertise will become less important than process and experience design. Societies and educational institutions will remain resistant to many of these changes because we don't have good ways of measuring the performance of educational innovations in improving the abilities of students, progress will be slow. Innovation will truly take off if and when we develop better ways of measuring a person's competencies independently of his or her educational credentials. That was it. Education in 2030. My predictions and my, my ideas and my hopes. Thank you very much for being with me today. Now I'm going to pass the baton back to Nikki. All those kids around us, I mean, not kids, kids uh, compared to my age, they are young adults uh, about their career. Since now they are at university, most of them are masters, PhD uh, degree, um, how they should go about for the rest of their life in terms of learning and, and lifelong uh, learning. What is your advice? Well, the advice is what I mentioned in the talk, which is focus, number one, focus on the transferable fundamental competencies of life, creative thinking, working with, with others, learning how to learn, learning how to competently um, assess information, figuring out the lies from the truth. I mean, developing resilience. These are really, really the competencies that will determine success in 10, 20, 30 years. It's not so much how well you know mathematics and how, you know, well you can do Excel. I mean, these things are important, but, but you know, they will only take you so far. That's the number one. The second thing is uh, focus on building relationships. I mean, you know, it's very Excellent. easy to find knowledge about anything. What is becoming more difficult is figuring out what it is that you need to learn next, what it is that you maybe are weak and you need to improve on. And these things are best done through mentoring and peer relationships. Embed yourself in communities, right, of peers, communities of mentors, seek them out and keep them for life. And, you know, the last thing is uh, most of learning doesn't happen by listening in classrooms. Most of learning happens by doing. So make sure that you take advantage as much as you can of practical learning opportunities. Do as many internships as you can. Go on the Internet, mm -hmm. participate in competitions, you know, put your work out there. I mean, this is really, really how uh, both you're going to learn and how you're going to be noticed. Chris Santos de la Roca, thank you so much. You're very welcome, Nidhi, a real pleasure. Thank you.